right here. And it's basically a rootkit uh, inside the multiple track hub. And Michael Sandler is developing the Trojan part, which is on top of my base. And I'm developing the core of the rootkit, which um, basically attacks all operating systems and is responsible for um, loading at the boot and injecting code into the memory, into uh, the running operating system and running the side operating system, and then loading the payload um, beside the operating system in full um, system writes. So it's injecting code into the kernel mode, which uh, is prevented with Windows Vista 64-bit. There you can't load any unsigned driver code anymore. And using my bootkit, you can load any unsigned code into kernel. And then you can basically do everything. Has You have full access to the whole system, and you can do whatever you want. Um, we are going to introduce you the next version of it. And we are showing you then how it works and the new techniques it has. And what has changed since the last version is now the remote surveillance software. That is the Trojan on top of it. And we will show you a small live demonstration how it works. And on the end, we'll also talk a bit about TPM and how you can defeat it and how it can prevent from my attack. Um, uh, I'm Peter Geisner, and I have um, had some auto talks. I've worked one year at an antivirus company, and I'm basically doing research in the operating system and in general software. I'm writing everything in assembly language and uh, all do doing that all at the very low level of the computer. And um, I have, I'm developing the Stone Boot Kit now together with Michael Sandel and with Pippin Kuma, who developed also the Way Boot Kit and Way Boot Kit 2.0, which were famous for first attacking Windows 7 and loading unset code into it. Um, he held also presentations at Black Hat, and I had also a Black Hat talk and some other talks. Unfortunately, I can't show you everything because there's currently a court case running against me. So I do not have my original notebook and I had to write everything from scratch and all the information here and can only um, talk from scratch because they have my original notebook currently in custody and so I can show you all features. Um, previously announced that I will show that the Stone Boot Kit would work also for Linux and 64-bit Windows but I had to stop the development of it. And so I can show you only the intermediate results. Um, but I think it is also going to be interesting because um, there are lots of things that were new since the last presentation. And I will show you just those things. And yeah, keep in mind that's everything just from scratch. And so it was uh, quite a tough work, but I have also written a paper about it. You can then also download it from the DeepSec website and yeah, that contains all the information. Um, the boot kit is a root kit that is stored inside the master record. That means it's loaded at the very first level directly from the BIOS and it's um, basically like operating system. So it's loaded before the operating system and then it, it executes and stores its code into the end of memory and hooks some functions and then it loads the original operating system, in most cases Windows. And then on, on sometimes it will, um, will get called through interrupts or hooks. And then it will also it will, it'll get from one stage to the next and um, keep, keep keeping transforming from real mode to protected mode from different processor modes. And it does then exploiting um, the design of Windows and of the whole uh, Intel architecture and um, loads then a payload and which demonstrates then that it works. And for the demonstration, there are different payloads currently available and shipped with Stone. One is the remote surveillance software and another one is the command line privilege escalation, which works um, just at the, the consoler, the cmd.exe, is escalated to system rights and when it do a whoami.exe, it will show that it has now system rights and not normal user rights. And the whole thing is that you can go to any computer and you can store up the boot kit on it and then you can boot and the boot kit will um, raise you all rights you want and can do everything it wants and the operating system has no longer the full control over it 
and the bootkit a text operating system. And the interesting thing is that it can be um, made everything operating system independent. So currently there is um, support for all 32-bit Windows operating systems starting from 2000 up to Windows 7. And we're currently also working for supporting Linux and partly 64-bit is also a tech but that's currently under development. Um, as you can see here, the execution flow is loaded by the BIOS. The master boot record is the first sector on a hard disk, which is always loaded. And normally it contains just a simple bootloader, which loads the bootloader of Windows. And in our case, it loads the bootkit and then loads the Windows loader. And our attack is only done in memory. That means if you restart your system, everything is vanished. And we do not patch any system file on the hard disk, but only in memory. And this is also this is um, good against detection because antivirus um, antiviruses normally do just um, make detection on hard disk. And if it's in the memory, then it can, can also hide itself. It can hook, for example, the, um, the Windows functions, for example, create file API, or it can hook itself and hook the, the driver stack and gets all the calls that when it wants to read the hard disk. And then when accessing the master boot record, it can just um, hide itself, the bootkit, by just simply um, pointing to another place where the original backup is done. And the bootkit itself is quite small. It's just a, a boot sector, the 500 bytes. And everything is written in assembly language, so it's just a few kilobytes of code. But it can do a lot with that. And here you see a typical Windows startup. That means it starts with the master boot record. And the master boot record is replaced by our stone bootkit loader, which loads the stone bootkit into memory and then loads the partition boot loader, which is from Windows. And then it will go um, through all steps of the Windows startup, um, starting with the NT loader and on the WIST and Windows 7, it's the boot manager, which starts OS loader and then switches to 30-bit mode, protected mode. And then it will start um, NTOS kernel, load all our boot drivers into memory, the HAL.TLL, and initializes the whole system. And these are also the points where the bootkit has to move. Um, because there are different operating system um, modes, processor modes. So you have to make the transform from 62-bit 16-bit to 32-bit. And you have to always keep care that you are executed. That means that you have to, to patch functions of Windows, um, which are typically the, the Windows, the initial, initial load file function, which loads all Windows system files, like NTOS kernel, and when you hook that, you get all the cores, and you see all the files that are loaded, and you can then um, patch them in memory, and you have also to keep, keep care that the, the hashes are valid, that you hook also the hash functions, or you can recalculate the hash of the, the PE file, and then Windows won't detect any change. And later, you have to keep care that, that it is executed beside the kernel, and you do that by patching NTOS kernel in memory. And there are very, uh, there are a lot of tricky things because you have always just a small amount of memory. For example, when transforming from 16-bit to 32-bit, it's writing itself on the end of N the NTOS kernel image, which all, which differs between all operating system versions. So there are small things which are different between every Windows version, and partly also between source specs. For example, between Windows. Server 2000 and 2003, um, Windows Server 2003 and 2003 R2. And, but basically the signatures for the files, which search for functions to hook and to patch, so it keeps called and undetected, are the same for all Windows versions. Because the signatures um, I'm scanning for are just assembly code instructions, and they don't differ much. Even if the C++ code is moved to another place, the assembly code will be still the same. So. The signatures are all, nearly all the same for all different Windows operating systems from 2000 up to Windows 7. But of course, for supporting 64-bit, there uh, has to be much, much more done. And the uh, 64-bit architecture has also a lot of changes. Mm. Previously, I have stored the whole bootkit into the master boot record because the first 64-bit, uh, the first 63, uh, sectors were free. They were not occupied by anything. The 
first partition always started on 64. Um, but now I have moved that concept because the AV industry, they check only the master boot record, so they read the master boot record and check against signatures. And you can fight against those um, if you patch a few instructions into the boot loader of Microsoft, which just load the real boot kit from the end of memory and place it into memory and execute it. These are just um, about eight instructions. And then you just patch the Microsoft bootloader, you inject instructions, and they, they can't make a signature out of it because the antivirus companies, they make, for example, a signature about 206, 300 bytes, and here you can't detect those eight additional bytes. So the bootkit is stored on the end of memory, and previously I have only, I've only stored the payload driver file on it, and now I'm using the unpartitioned space at the end to store all the bootkit files, to hide it um, from the other file systems, which are normally um, accessible and viewable under Windows. So you need a special driver to read my, my own file system. I have called it RawFS, which is uh, a very simple file system that stores just my bootkit files. And so no one will ever see those files, and no one other than me or my bootkit will have access to those files. And here you see, you can see the boot record of my bootkit um, that shows that this binary is loaded into memory. It consists of multiple modules, and each module has something to do. For example, we have the um, system loader, which just loads everything into system, and we have to provide our own file system drivers and hard disk drivers in the bootkit because Windows is, of course, not available. And some other function, for example, the crypto module is used for um, for the for the hibernation file, um, so we can inject uh, any code into the hibernation file, and when Windows resumes from hibernation, then it will load the modified content into memory, and it does not do any checks. There is just a MD5 uh, checksum, no, a CRC32 checksum, but you can set it to zero, and Windows will then not check it, so it will load the modified hibernation file into memory, and this is also a way how you can bring unsigned code into the kernel. And this issue was reported. However, they have not fixed it and haven't heard that they want to fix it. Um, currently, I have only developed this, it as proof of concept. Um, so there was no real attack against it. But however, it's, it's still attackable. And which is also used, uh, the hibernation file is also used for some forensics. Um, because there are, of course, the whole memory content stored. So that's quite interesting for law enforcement agencies. And there had been another talk at Black Hat about the encryption and everything of it. Um, then we have um, one module for attacking Windows, which contains then the whole signatures for the files and the functions which, which preserve and which will um, act in the bootkit in the memory and will place it always onto the right place and just, it's always patching the Windows files in memory and attacks them. And for Linux, there's then, of course, another module. And before, and when the operating system is executed, it will be determined which operating system is now running, and then the module is called. Here we can see the, the file system I have, I'm using. Um, it's basically very simple. You are just using the unpartitioned space the, that is on the end of space. Normally, they're about 10 megabytes free on every hard disk. On the Windows, you can't um, make the partition over the whole space. They will always stay about 10 megabytes free. And Windows also uses it for its own purposes. And I'm using it to store my files and to hide it from the other operating system. And uh, here, the structure is just that you have a simple file table which tells you the position of every file and the position of the next file table path. And um, the file table um, contains the MD5 hashes of the names. So I know that for the want the file slash bootkit, then we'll use and then we'll search for the hash and then it tells me the location and the size of it. And this is very interesting um, when working together with encryption, because for example, if you encrypt your drive, uh, independent if you encrypt it um, only the system partition or the whole hard disk, then you will al always have the master record unencrypted. 
and you will always know the position of unpartitioned space because the partition table also will not be hidden. So when the whole hard disk is encrypted, you know, at the end of space, okay, there's place and there can storm a files, and the master book record always stays unencrypted. Of course, it contains the decryption software, um, for example, TrueCrypt, and you can simply overwrite it and place your own software. So when you have a fully encrypted hard drive, you can infect it with the stoned boot kit, and it also works. Um, and to show that example, that's for example, Live CD, which is based on Windows PE, um, that's Windows pre-installation environment. Um, that's a small Windows that runs on a CD, which has only the basic APIs and functionality available. Uh, but which is more than enough for our usage. And Windows P is, for example, used for the Windows setup. And you can develop your, your own um, process for it, your own graphic user interface. And in our case, we have just the uh, Infector, which places the bootkit onto the hard disk and does nothing more, and just some starting some other programs, um, um, just some diagnostic stuff. And the live CD, and you can just insert the live CD into any computer, boot from it, and then you can infect any computer with it, also if it's encrypted. And of course, you can also place the Windows PE on any uh, flash drive, so you can also use a USB stick. And the thing is created with the Windows installation kit, uh, Windows automated installation kit, which is freely downloadable and freely usable for any purpose. And um, beside the Infector CD, which is, for example, interesting for law enforcement agencies if they have physical access, I've also created a native CD, which does nothing more than placing uh, stone only into memory, not infecting the hard disk, which is interesting for testing purposes. And for this, there is the L3 to bootable CD-ROM specification, which tells just to which tells just how it has to look. And it loads just the bootkit into memory, and my bootkit will load then the main operating system. And I use this for testing it on my own hardware, because it would be uncool, of course, if, if the bootkit wouldn't work, and then if the whole PC would hang and I could nothing do. And the Infecto CD, for example, also contains the restart program, which, which um, takes the backup and writes it back to the master boot record and uninstalls the bootkit. And um, on displays, I want to ask Michael Sender to continue. He is the developer of the Trojan, which is on top. I will tell you later about how it works on top, um, because you have different payloads. And his, his Trojan is developed independently from my Stone Bootkit. It's a normal Windows application. And in my Bootkit, there exists a simple Excel loader, which loads, the, which loads his Trojan into memory and gives it full system rights and which also hides it from the operating system. It's loaded by me, by Stone. And also the PE format is, is interpreted and it's relocated and the input address table is resolved by the Stone bootkit so the operating system will never get in touch with the file. And so you can also pretty hide it good in front of the operating system, which is um, also one of the main differences between a rootkit and a bootkit. A bootkit starts from, from zero, from before the operating system, has its own drivers and does everything itself. And the rootkit uses um, only system functions and requires also the operating system to boot and also needs the operating system API. So, please. First of all, uh, here's our agenda. Uh, first, uh, <coughs> what this is about and the concept futures and what kind of plugins it uses. First of all, about the RST. As the RST is a tool, a tool for monitoring and manipulating computers. <coughs> well, in the, I've tried to, to explain many people <laughs> what it really is, but it's easier to call it a Trojan. <coughs> but um, exactly, and the RST is a toolkit utilizing various technologies um, to control vast amounts of PCs for the use of administration, surveillance, information gathering, and other uses well, <laughs> you probably can think of. <laughs> so, <coughs> well, features. 
It uses different ways of encryption <coughs> and uh, com uh, communication. Um, it uses plugins for nearly everything, so it is very versatile and it can be nearly everything you want. Then authentication, also a nice feature using RSA or DSA. Then <coughs> it's completely scriptable, means uh, it does not need to maintain a permanent connection to its control server to do <coughs> things, then updating. Um, it's able to update uh, well itself or just plugins, and also update um, them without restarting the main executable. Then <coughs> another concept you, uh, used in there is code in the wire, which was actually um, mentioned by someone else before, but <laughs> I don't remember where I read this. And then also no, uh, also droppers, which I'm going to discuss later. Then the concept. As I said, it's completely based on plugins, which are currently simple uh, PE images, which are loaded into the main process. Then the imports are resolved and, well, it's run. <coughs> it utilizes the code concept of code in the wire, which I'm as I said later, uh, going to explain, and well, it's used for executing code from the cloud. <laughs> Another cloud service. <clears throat> ah, the next part, I saw this, <clears throat> was not gonna making it in the final presentation, but well, it's there. <laughs> then developed and tested with for the Stone Bootkit, which means it's totally compatible with the Stone Bootkit and also uses some features which <coughs> are normally not available to end users of this kit. Then plugins, as I said, plugins for everything. Uh, <coughs> communication, well, it can, it can communicate with its control server over TCP IP, <coughs> uh, normal sockets, <coughs> Then various peer-to-peer -peer networks or web 2.0 network services like Twitter and Co. Then <coughs> plugins for authentication, RSA, DSA, or whatever suits you. Then encryption. Well, I've currently only implemented Shiva Saver 2, which is uh, based on RSC 4, but it's kind of more secure. Then commands, well, um, as I said, you can load PE images into it and just run them and <clears throat> with this it can make really nearly everything. Then also no plugins for other uses. Well, the stop is very extensible, which means um, you can, yeah, also write plugins for <clears throat> other things like systems management or <coughs> or providing a web interface to the whole thing. So then the communication plugins. Well, they give the possibility to using nearly any medium for communication, as I said, TCP, UDP, or another nice thing are raw IP packets with syn ACK uh, requests as to transfer data or using the sequence number <clears throat> or just putting anything there which looks not suspicious. <laughs> then, as mentioned, Twitter and Co, which has been, which was seen um, also with other bots which use these services. Then Pastebin, uh, something like this can also be used simply for this. Then one click hosters, also a nice thing. There are many, really many one click hosters out there and well, it's not really hard to use them to <coughs> distribute commands or new updates. Then P2P networks, um, well, it works with DHDs or Overnet, Nutella, well, whatever you can 
write a plugin for you can use. So command plugins and code in the wire. <clears throat> well, it can do everything with the plugins. For example, if someone likes it, it could control your coffee machine <laughs> from remote, um, well, or just for system management or <clears throat> collecting data. Then code in the wire. This is actually, the concept is that the code is never ever stored on the disk, but just transferred to the host computer, stored in memory, and then directly executes, executes. which means it only exists, <coughs> well, in the wires. So, scripting and droppers. <coughs> the RST is totally <laughs> scriptable and uses so-called droppers to submit then the information to specified hosts. <coughs> well, it can go, I've currently implemented you, uh, droppers for HTTP and SMTP, but you can use virtually any protocol you want and you can have, so write a server for it. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Then, what's going on in the future? Also, uh, planned is support for more platforms uh, like Linux, Mac OS X, <coughs> all the like, BSD systems, then platform independent plugins. Also nice because it um, means that uh, the stop cares um, how <coughs> Uh, the stop loads uh, image uh, don't have to be PE or ELF or something like this, but it gets executed on any X86 uh, platform or X64 if you uh, if uh, the stop uh, runs on this platform. Then <coughs> also planned are poly or metamorphic stops to make it uh, very hard to detect. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will continue on this. Um, of course, the bootkit was not just a new introduction by me. It has existed since many, many years. Um, it, I think the first um, time it appeared in history was in 1987 by the original Rice Stone. This is also why the name Stone came there. And um, Stone just displayed a message: "Your PC is now stoned." And it had not done it had not done much. It just was spreading itself using the boot sector. So when it's loaded uh, from floppy, for example, when it's executed, booted from floppy, it will store itself in the memory. And then every time a disk write occurs, it will check if the boot sector is infected. And if not, then it will spread itself over the boot sector of the hard disk or floppy drive. Um, so it was quite famous in the past, um, in the mid 90s. And I have, I have taken the message, your PC is now stoned again, which is then always displayed when booting. And then you know that your computer is stoned. And the very interesting thing on, th on that is that it's operating system independent, because today we have all viruses are normally dependent on, on Linux, Mac OS X, or on Windows. And the original stoned virus was really independent from the operating system, because it just hooked the BIOS and the, the operating system calls the BIOS. So uh, independent if, if Windows was used or if DOS was used, um, it always infected the floppies and all hard disks. And this was a quite cool thing, but of course today, um, when using the 32-bit operating systems, that's not, um, not easy and not that po easy, easily possible anymore. Now we have to, there's not a totally generic way, but you can, uh, make a module for Linux and for Windows, and you can keep it quite abstract, so you can do a good job for making virus for both Windows and Linux platforms. And of course, there uh, is already a technique against it. There's a trusted platform module. Um, the trusted platform module stores hashes of every, every single boot file um, into, a, um, into a secret storage. 
and the BIOS um, sends the hash of the boot sector and of itself to the TPM module. And only if all hashes are valid, then the TPM module will give free the decryption key, and only then it can load all Windows start files. So if you modify, if you modify the BIOS, if you modify the master boot record, then your computer will abort to start because the TPM won't give free the decryption key, and then you can you cannot boot anymore. Um, there is, however, a security flaw because the TPM says when restarting the computer, it should erase the whole memory with zero. However, the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, is just a passive um, module. It won't modify the memory or check the memory. Um, so it, it says that the specification says the software should erase the memory. And of course, you can always do something against the software. You cannot patch the BIOS because then the hash would be invalid. But what you can do is using the debug registers of the processor to set those breakpoints to the according um, places. Um, and then you can intercept the cores. Uh, you can then intercept when the BIOS will load the, the boot sector. And then you can say, OK, don't load um, that boot sector, load another. And you don't have to patch the BIOS, but you can use the debug registers to um, hook it. And what you have to do is you need two signatures, um, one for, for finding the, the code which erases the memory, because you place a bootkit um, in the memory, on the end of the memory. And then you have to find the code in the BIOS which erases those memory. And you set the breakpoint on it. And then you will just keep those few instructions. And then the second is when it loads the bootloader. Um, you have then moved the bootloader to the backup. And the whole thing is then that you do a restart. So you jump to the initial point of the BIOS. And then it will reset the TPM. Then it wants to overwrite the memory, but the bootkit the debug breakpoint of the bootkit will say, OK, skip those few instructions. Then it will wants to load the, or the, the boot sector. And the bootkit will say, OK, load another boot sector, the backup. And then the bootkit will be placed in memory. And the BIOS will, will load the original, um, the original bootloader of Windows. And it won't detect any, any change, because the hashes are valid. The BIOS won't be modified. Um, the, it loads the original bootloader, which is also not modified, and then it will. Then you can basically inject um, unsent code, uncrusted code, and then the system is compromised. And the TPM should just make the whole system um, trusted, and so you can install my bootkit on a TPM secured system, also encrypted system. And it will, you can initially approach it, for example, and it will get full access rights, and there won't be any modifications detected. And um, so that's it. I have placed here a few references. There are quite good ones available. And I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank Michael Sendler for joining here tonight and holding his presentation. OK, thank you. Thank you.
that VPN specification to make it more secure, so it's not only black hat stuff. You can also um, have the Windows executable in Factor, so a normal executable, which just writes the master record on the disk. However, there um, are limitations if there is, for example, an antivirus running, which will protect the master record, then this is a limitation. So if you have physical access, then it's um, quite better because you can use the boot CD or USB flash drive to start from and infect it. Or you can also take just a hard disk and write it raw on the hard disk. If, for example, booting from the CD is disabled in the file. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, is the microphone actually on? I don't think so. more questions.